direct your attention to the screen for this week's video announcements. If this is your first time attending Calvary, we want to welcome you as a special guest. At Calvary, our mission is to know God and make Him known at home and abroad as we gather, grow, and go. If you fill out the connection card in your worship guide, tear it off and take it to the Welcome Center after the service, we would love to meet you and have a special gift for you. To find out more about Calvary and the ministries happening each week, visit our website. We praise God and are thankful for the generosity of those involved in providing the ladies' luncheon yesterday. Over 75 ladies attended our ladies' luncheon and were blessed with great food, fun, and fellowship as they gathered to grow in Christ. We desire to see followers of Christ grow in discipleship. One way this happens is through Bible study in growth groups. New growth groups will begin May 12th and will meet on Sunday mornings, 9.30 to 10.30 a.m. Sign-ups for growth groups will begin next Sunday. Every day, our kids are bombarded with questions. Did God really create everything? Why do bad things happen? Was Noah's Ark real? Why do I need to be saved? Can I trust the Bible? At the Great Jungle Journey VBS, kids will explore the biblical answers to these questions as they set off on an epic adventure from Genesis to Revelation. Kids need your help on the journey. Will you please pray and ask God how you can be involved in VBS this summer? As you are led to be involved, please complete the volunteer form online or the paper form which is available at the Welcome Center. Or scan the QR code to easily complete the online volunteer form or register kids for VBS. Parents, it's not too early to register children for VBS. We hope your child will be involved in the Great Jungle Journey VBS. We are a welcoming church and our church staff is glad to see you during the week. However, if you plan to be on the church campus working or visiting during the week, please stop by the church office and sign the visitor's log. Today, Pastor Joe will continue in 1 Corinthians. Today's sermon for the Lord is based on 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 through 20. Once again, welcome to Calvary Baptist Church as we worship a risen Savior. Good morning, everyone. For the three people who are here that don't know me, I'm Jenny Cronkite. I'm the chairman of the missions committee here at Calvary. And it's a new month, so we have a new Be the Change. Be the Change is we're collecting coins, small bills, large bills, checks, money orders, whatever. And we're giving them to a local ministry. Last month was J316, and we got $180 for them. It was pretty good. So we're happy for that. This month, we usually do Solve House because they're moms and babies and things like that. And we have like a baby shower where we collect clothes and diapers and wipes and all of that kind of stuff. Well, I'm volunteering there, and they told me we don't need clothes or diapers or wipes or any of that stuff. They need things like aluminum foil and Ziploc bags and cleaning supplies because they actually have so many, so many clothes, they don't have room for them. They have them packed in boxes. The diapers and wipes, they're giving out to other organizations because they don't have room for it. So household items, cleaning supplies, um, washcloths, dishcloths, not washcloths, dishcloths, dish towels, paper towels, any of those kind of things. I was supposed to have a list that you guys could pick up and so you could start buying supplies if you want to do that, but 
didn't get it made up. So next week there will be one back in the back. Um, you can still put money in, and then I'll just go and purchase all the items that they need. So that's going to be our Be the Change for the month of April. Thank you. Well, good morning. It is good to see you all here this morning. And I know last week we had Easter, but we still gather on Sunday to celebrate the resurrection every week. And so we're excited to be here this morning as we gather to worship and make much of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's begin our worship with a time of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you now and we thank you, Lord, that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. And Lord, I thank you that while we take a specific Sunday each year to celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Lord, I thank you that we celebrate that resurrection every Sunday. Because the blood of Jesus Christ is sufficient to cover the sins of the world to everyone who would call upon the name of Jesus. And so, Lord, I pray this morning as we gather in this time of worship, Lord, I pray that you would help us to set aside all the distractions and the things that would take our minds' attention. And that this morning we would be focused on you and you alone. Lord, that we would worship in spirit and in truth today. That you would be glorified in this place as we gather together as the body of Christ, to worship Jesus. Have your way in this place today. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jacob, and I'm the worship coordinator here. So we're going to praise the Lord this morning. Why don't you stand, and we're going to sing together. What wonder, what wonders, what love this is That Christ would die for me His goodness, His merit, His righteousness The sinner's only plea O oh, foolish pride, be crucified The work is finished All my boast is in Jesus all my hope is His love, and I will glory forever in what the cross has done. Now fully forgiven, my life is filled with graces undeserved. For mercy that flowed down the sacred hill, that praises now return. Rise up, my soul, and bless the Lord, who else is worthy. All my boast is in Jesus, all my hope is His God, and I will glory forever in what the cross has done. Oh, praise the one. Forever blessed Him alone My heart adores And I will boast In nothing less Than the love of Christ my Lord But in the grace of God, I glory in weakness to live is Christ in plenty or in want. That I may know, that all may see is power within me. All my boast is in Jesus, all my hope is his 
We're going to have our uh, time of offering right now and continue in our time of worship. Uh, Bob Moore, if you would pray for our offering. Let's pray together. Lord, indeed, we do thank you that our boast in Jesus is in Jesus Christ. Not in ourselves or what we can do, but it's all because of what Christ has done for us on the cross. And what a privilege we have to be here this morning to give to the effect of your word going out and touching other lives, for your gospel going forth, and that they can too make their boast in you because of receiving Christ as their Savior. And as we take this offering, may those things that we offer to you as cheerful givers be used for your glory to bring others to the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the privilege and for the power of your resurrection that brings us here together and helps us to go forth to present the word to others. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Sing with us. Love is our hope in life and death. Christ alone, Christ alone. Word is our only confidence. That our souls to Him belong. Who holds our days within his hand? What comes apart from his command? And what will keep us to the end? The love of Christ in which we stand. Oh, sing Yeah. 
and what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with Him, there we will rise to meet the Lord, then sin and death will be destroyed, and we will feast in endless joy, when Christ is ours forevermore.
Well, good morning again. It is good to be together. And this morning we are continuing in our uh, series in the book of 1 Corinthians. And uh, last uh, two weeks ago we looked at uh, the first part of chapter 6. And today we're going to finish out with 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6 looking at verses 12 through 20. So I'm going to read God's word. Uh, We will pray and we'll see what God has for us today. 1 Corinthians Chapter 6, starting with verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord... And will also raise, up, raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I do thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you that we have another opportunity together. Lord, I thank you that we have another opportunity to worship and make much of who you are. Lord, I pray that as we continue in our worship today through the study of your word, Lord, I pray that you would set me to the side. Lord, that it would be your word that is prominent today. It would be your word that we hear today. And Lord, I pray that where we find ourselves not in line with your word, Lord, that we would repent, that we would commit again to following you, to living lives of holiness. Lord, have your way in this place today. This is your church. We are your people. Have your way in this place. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Two weeks ago, when we looked at the first part of chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, um, Paul was addressing um, uh, sin within the church. And and one of the things, he gives a whole litany of different sins that would keep us out of heaven. And the reality is is that all sin keeps us out of heaven. Uh, We are all sinners. We are all in need of a Savior. None of us can get to heaven on our own. It's only through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's only through receiving His righteousness applied to our account um, that we are made in right relationship with God so that we get into heaven. And so uh, two weeks ago, we looked at where Paul had addressed a number of different sins uh, that, that, that people dealt with. And he focuses in in the last half of chapter 6 on specifically sexual immorality within the church and within the body of Christ, within individual members. 
And he begins by saying, all things are lawful for me. Now, what he is saying there is actually a quote that had become uh, popular in Corinth in, in, in that day and age. And where it came from was that these people who were believers, who claimed to be followers of Christ, recognizing that through their salvation from Jesus Christ, they were made in right relationship with God, and therefore they were no longer under condemnation. Uh, we, we read that in, in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is one of many verses in which we would, would, would uh, land on the, the concept of, of salvation not being something that we can lose. I remember a story about a, about a, a guy who, who moved to a new town and he, he went to a church and he was talking with the pastor um, after, uh, after church and he said, you know, and they were just talking, he said, I'm new to the area and I'm learning my way around. He says, I actually need a, a good place to, 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 get, to get a shave. And, uh, and the pastor says, well, my wife actually has a place you can go to. And so the, the next day, the guy went to the, to the, to the pastor's wife's uh, beauty shop or whatever it was there. I don't guess men go to beauty shop. But anyways, he goes and, and he gets a shave. And, and man, it's the best shave he's ever had. And he, he actually goes to church the next Sunday. And, and, and the pastor says, hey, I heard you came by and saw my wife. He says, yeah, she gave me a shave. And man, I, I haven't needed to shave all week. It's been, it's been incredible, the most incredible shave that I've ever had. And he says, well, I'm glad you liked it. And next week, he comes back to church again. And, and he says, hey, how are you doing? He says, I mean, this is incredible. He says, that your wife shaved me two weeks ago almost, and I still don't need to shave. There's been no, no hair on my face, and I just don't, I don't understand. I've never had a shave like this. And the pastor says, well, listen, what you don't understand is that my wife's name is Grace, and once shaved, always shaved. <laughs> Sorry, I know, it's bad, bad jokes. Larry, I was just trying to compete with you in class over there with your, with your jokes, so. I was supposed to say you're, you're shaved by grace and once shaved, always shaved. Sorry, I missed a line in there. Anyways, the, the truth is, is that um, uh, while, while I don't love the express in expression once saved, always saved, I think it more accurately we should say if saved, always saved. Because I believe that we see that in God's word that he says that no one can remove us from his hand. Um, the Bible says that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so I believe that when we look at the full counsel of the word of God, we see an understanding that once received salvation, they do not lose that salvation. But being careful to recognize that there are people who think they are saved, but have never received salvation. And, and I'll tell you, some, someday I'm sure I'll preach a, 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 ta a sermon on the, the passage of the, the, um, the, the seed that lands on the different kinds of soil. You know, only one of those is somebody actually rejects totally the gospel. And only one of those soils that we read about in there does someone actually receive salvation. The other two, the individuals think that they are saved, but they've actually never placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And so I do believe that when someone has truly placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, they are saved and they do not lose that salvation. And so that means we can live however we want to live. We can sin as much as we want to sin because we don't lose our salvation, right? No, that was, that was incorrect. And for those who called it, yes, that was sarcasm. We, we can't just live however we want to live. Paul actually said in Romans chapter 6, uh, at the beginning of chapter 6, he says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. Just because we are saved, just because our salvation is secure, and I'm thankful in that. I'm thankful that when I make mistakes, and I make mistakes, anybody with me? We could start a club, right? I'm Joe Lemons, and I make mistakes. We all make mistakes. None of us are perfect. None of us, after salvation, are perfect and without sin. But all of us, after salvation, are are made justified in Jesus Christ. And that's the hope that we have. But the problem that, the, that some of these in, in the church in Corinth were, were having was they had this, this expression, all things are all for me, I'm saved, and so now for I no longer have to worry about this sin separating me from God and causing me to spend an eternity in hell. Now I know I'm going to get to go to heaven, so it doesn't matter how I live. But Paul had already warned them, no, that's not how this works. He says all things are all for me, but not all things are helpful. Not all things are profitable. And while it is true that we do not lose our salvation if we are truly saved just because we let sin have a hold in our life again, that does not mean that we don't face the consequences for that sin. Because there are consequences here on this world for sin. And while as those of us who are saved, when we make a mistake and we sin, we don't face the eternal consequences of that sin because we have been justified, we still face the, the physical, the earthly, the worldly consequences for that sin. 
And so they said, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. When Jesus Christ has set us free, let us no longer give sin a foothold within our lives. In Galatians 5.1, Paul writes, For freedom Christ has set free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Let me tell you something. The devil wants nothing more than when someone receives salvation, when they enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, when they are justified, the devil wants nothing more than to get you tripped up and messed up and twisted up so that you're no good for the kingdom. Because we've let sin have a foothold in our life once again. And so Paul says right there, it's for freedom that Christ set us free. Jesus set us free from the bondage of slavery. Jesus set us free from slavery of sin. Let's not go back into it anymore. You know, I love the the, the picture in the Old Testament. As God's chosen people, Israel, have been enslaved in Egypt for, for, for so many years. And then God raises up a man, Moses. And he says to Moses, he says, you're going to be my mouthpiece. Go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. And it's a long, long story, but through a process, finally Pharaoh relents and he lets God's people go out of slavery in Egypt so that they can go to the promised land. (coughs) That was a foreshadowing of Jesus. Because we, like the people of Israel who were enslaved in Egypt, we are enslaved in sin. And God, seeing mankind in their slavery and their, in their bondage to sins, raised up a man, sent His Son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus came and He said, let my people go. And His death, burial, and resurrection on the cross gives us the opportunity for salvation so that we will no longer be enslaved in sin like the people of Israel were enslaved in Egypt, but we are set free to pursue the promised land, to live holy lives. But just like those people of Israel after that, and man, you go read that story, it wasn't long after they got set free from slavery in Egypt that they were complaining. They were grumbling. They were saying to Moses, it had been better, it was better for us back in Egypt. We had more food back there as slaves. And the problem is we can get caught up in that sometimes too, thinking that that life of sin was somehow better. We we think back to the to the fleeting moments of, 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 of physical pleasure, physical passions that were pursued, and we forget that Jesus Christ set us free from that so that we can walk in holiness. Another expression that the Corinthians evidently said was that food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. I I, I guess I kind of like that expression. I like food. As a matter of fact, that, that might be one of my problems in life is that I like food. I like a lot of food. But what the Corinthians were saying was, listen, the the stomach was made for food and food for the stomach. And and there was actually even a belief in this time in which the physical world and everything physical was evil. And so it didn't really matter. We were only supposed to pursue the the spiritual. And so whatever happened in the physical world really didn't matter anymore. And so the people in Corinthians were saying, food is for the stomach and the stomach is for food. And they probably were saying that to say, well, the body is for sexual gratification and sexual gratification is for the body. And so we can live however we want to live. But that's not how God told us to live as believers when we have been set free from slavery. Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, he says, Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. As believers, we're called to walk in holiness. Not to continue to walk in sin. Not to continue to let sin reign in our mortal bodies. But we're supposed to walk in holiness. And it doesn't mean that we're perfect, but it means that we're saved and we're forgiven. And it means that, that I'm better today than I was yesterday. And by the grace of God, if Jesus Christ doesn't come back, I'll be better tomorrow than I was today if we're walking in holiness pursuing righteousness and that doesn't save us we're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ but because I am saved I now desire to live differently because of who Jesus is you know God gave us God gave us the 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 marriage so that we could to help us understand that right I mean I've got this woman who I've been married to for it'll be it'll be 19 years this November right I got that right did I 19 years okay good 19 years this, this November. I, I, wear, I wear this wedding ring to signify that I'm married. Now, if I take that wedding ring off, I'm not not married. I'm in trouble if I lose it, but I'm not not married. You know, when, when I met this woman named Becky, as a matter of fact, and there's, there's a long story, I'm the poster child for persistence when it comes to talking her into dating me. 
It took over two years until she finally said those magic words, I guess we're dating now. See, I, I wore her down. My kids have been watching the old TV show uh, Family Matters with Steve Urkel. Y'all remember Steve Urkel? He, he loved Laura and she didn't love him. And he said, I'm wearing you down. That was my, I wore down until she finally said we were, we, we were dating. But you know, so, so then we, we dated for a while. And then I remember I, 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 I took her out to dinner one night and I was working at Manatee Baptist across town over here. And so we went back to the church there after dinner and I, I had it all set up and I had her go in and sit down and I went in and I washed her feet. Because I said, you know, Jesus washed his disciples' feet because he was modeling servant leadership. And in my marriage, I want to be a servant leader. And so at that point, for the first time in our relationship where we had known each other for multiple years, we were friends for multiple years, we dated for multiple years, and then finally that night I said, Becky, I love you. Will you marry me? And she said, have you talked to my father? (laughs) And I had, and we were good. (laughs) So let me tell you, you know, before I was married to Becky, I could pursue any woman that I wanted to, you know, like I could pursue any relationship that I wanted. Like I could pursue anything. I I was single. I was a free man. I could do what I wanted to do. And now that I'm married, I'm bound to this relationship and I wear this ring and I got this ball and chain. No, because I love my wife. I live differently than I did when I was single. Because I love and value this relationship that God has given me, I'm not going to pursue a relationship with another woman. Because I love my wife, I live differently. And, it's, and that's not what makes me married. I got married because I made a commitment to my wife. And because of that wonderful, joyous, incredible relationship that God gave us, I am now different than I was before. And that's the image of salvation. And that Jesus Christ justifies us from our sin. He saves us. He imparts His righteousness to us. Not because we've earned it. Not because we deserve it. Not because we did more good things than bad things. But simply because of His great love for us. He died on that cross. And when we receive that salvation, when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, the Bible says you will be saved. And my life is different, not because I'm somehow earning my salvation, but because of this relationship I have with Jesus. And I no longer want to pursue the things of the flesh, but I want to pursue the things of righteousness. That's why God gave us that marriage vision there, that image, so that we can understand what it means to walk in holiness. I'm different now because of who Jesus is and who he is in my life. And that's what the the Corinthians were not understanding here. They were saying food is for the stomach and the stomach is for food. But Paul told them in Galatians, he says, I say walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Some people say, well, listen, this body doesn't matter. It's going gonna, it's gonna to perish. But the truth is, is that God's going to raise up our bodies. Now, I am very thankful and grateful that as I understand it, as I read through the Bible and I study Um, you know, what heaven's going to be like, that I'm going to get a glorified body. Amen? The pains that you have. Like I got this one in my right heel that sometimes when I bend over just right, feels like somebody's driving a knife in there. Some mornings I wake up and I feel feel well past my age, at least I think, the way I hobble around. And for some reason, um, no matter what I do, it's probably just because I like to eat, food and eat good food and eat sweet food, you know. I, I, I've, I've grown God's temple here a little bit, you know. And I need, to, I need to work on that. But I'm thankful that one day I'll get a glorified body, right? But, but let me tell you something. God's given us this body now. This body is a, is a trial run. It's like I tell my kids, you know, they've they got those teeth right now that fall out, right? Because we get that practice set when we're young. So we learn how to take care of them. Because if you don't take care of that practice set, you won't know how to take care of that permanent set that you want to last for a while. Amen? You want those to last. God's given us this body as a practice, and we're supposed to try to glorify with Him. Now, one day we'll get a glorified body. But what we do here and now is important, and we're supposed to live for God. There's, there's principles throughout the, the, the New Testament that as we walk in righteousness, as we walk with Jesus after salvation, God is preparing us for what we will do in heaven. 
If you think that heaven is you sitting on a cloud strumming a harp, you've got a bad misconception about what heaven is. And that's often, that, honestly, that's why people don't say they don't want to go to heaven, if they're honest. I mean, everybody wants to go to heaven. Isn't that old song, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die, right? But the truth is, oftentimes, we don't even really think we want to go to heaven because we've got a misconception about what it is. But the truth is, is that God's got work for us to do. God's got plans, and it's going to be good, and it's going to be righteous, and it's going to be fulfilling. God's got things we're going to do, and, and we are preparing ourselves now here on this earth. And when we get to heaven, we will receive the reward and what we are given based on what we will be required to do. Now, don't misunderstand me. If you're saved, you get in. We talked about that a few weeks ago, how that some will be saved but by fire, like by the skin of their teeth. But as we walk in holiness, God's preparing us for what he has in the future. And so it's important how we live this life here. He says in verse 15, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Well, it takes on a whole new perception of who we are and what our bodies are for when we understand that once we've received Christ, we are our bodies of me- are members of Christ. He said, shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Now, what he's referencing there is that in the Corinthians, in, in, the, city, in, the, in the city of Corinth in that day and age, there was a lot of uh, false gods that people worshipped, so there were a lot of temples that were built to all sorts of different gods. And one of the, one of the uh, professions of that day was a temple prostitute. Because those false gods, the way that you would worship them would be to go spend time with those temple prostitutes. And, and evidently some of the church in Corinthian were participating in that. And Paul says, should, once we're saved, our bodies are members of Christ. Should we go unite the body of Christ with the prostitute? He says, never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. It's one of the most incredible things that God designed and made. I I think I told you all this the other week. It may have been last week or the week before. It's the only time in the Bible that one plus one equals one. It's the only time in, in creation that one plus one equals one. Because God said it's one man and one woman and they become one flesh. That's why when people get all, all caught up in, in, in this idea of husbands and wives and relationships and submitting and surrendering, and you know, God called Becky and I to be one. Yes, I'm called to be the head of the house. I'm called to be the spiritual leader. But let me tell you something. If half of my body makes a decision about something and doesn't consult the other half of the body, we're in trouble. I heard a pastor's wife say one time that the the husband may be the the head of the house, but the wife is the neck telling it which which way to turn. But but the truth is is that that Becky and I each have a role in the marriage, and and we figured it out pretty good, and some days are better than others because sometimes I'm an idiot. Men, right? Come on, sometimes we're an idiot. And you know what you do when you're an idiot, men? You know what you do when you make those mistakes? You go to your wife and you say, Honey, I was wrong and I'm sorry. And I need you to forgive me. I'm the spirit, I'm the head of my house. I do what I want to do. Well, you better want to apologize to your wife. Because when we're in sin, when we're wrong, it doesn't matter how much of a head of a house we are. If I've sinned against my wife, I need to tell her I'm sorry and ask her to forgive me. And if I've sinned against my wife in front of my children, I need to tell my children I'm sorry. So that they can see what it means to model walking with Jesus. Because the model they have is imperfect. And so they need to know when he messes up. And so that's what it means to walk in that. But, but so, so it says that, that that marriage relationship, that, 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 that the man and the wife become one flesh... There is something about the physical intimacy that God designed for marriage that brings, a, that brings a union, a one flesh union that we're not supposed to share with anybody else except our husband or our wife that God has given us. It's, 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 a, it's a gift from God that he gave for marriage. It is something that this, the devil has tried to, to destroy, d- distort and exploit in our world. And yet it was a gift that God gave that was good and holy and righteous in the context of marriage. And so he says, we're not supposed to step outside that. That's why, and, and, and the example was right there. He says, he says, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them a member of a prostitute? Never. Because that physical intimacy, that, that, that physical intimacy that God designed for marriage was meant for husbands and wives. And he says that in the same way with with Christ, we are one with Christ, and so therefore we're supposed to be careful with what we do with our body. He goes on to say, he says, flee from sexual immorality. The word that's used there, sexual immorality, is, is, is the Greek word pornea, and it means any type of sexual immorality, any type of, of, of sexual uh, activity that is outside the, the biblical confines of 
man and woman within marriage. And he says, flee from sexual immorality. Why? He says, every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Now I want to be very, very clear here. We're not talking about there is one sin that is heavier or weightier than another, that it's harder to be forgiven or it's harder for, for, for God to overcome. Sin is sin. And any sin separates us from God. But the Bible says very clearly, and this is not the only place, that while sexual sin doesn't carry a greater God, it does carry greater consequences here on this world, here on this earth. And it has a longer-lasting effect, longer-lasting consequences. And that's why we are supposed to guard ourselves sexually. Young people, that's why you need to make a commitment that you're going to follow God and refrain from any type of sexual activity until God brings that person into your life that you're supposed to spend the rest of your life with. Because when we honor God in that, when we live according to how God designed it to be, let me tell you something, we just, we just avoid a whole world of mess. And this world is messed up in it. And that's not just, just physical relationships. I'll tell you, the internet is an incredible tool I, I don't know how I got information before Google, okay? I think we had a set of encyclopedias at our house growing up. Does anybody have a set of encyclopedias, you know? Does anybody still have a set of encyclopedias because nobody wants it and you're stuck with it, you know? Because now it's dated and it's out and, and it's and it's and it's and it's out of touch. Man, now we just Google everything. Man, we got the World Wide Web right there at our as a matter of fact, I could mess y'all all up if I just said, Hey Siri, and started giving commands to your phones, you know? Matter of fact, Pastor Mark and I were meeting this past week, and he said something about Sirius, and Siri popped up on my, my laptop or my iPad and said, How can I help you? you know? <laughs> and I'll tell you, with as great as some of this technology is, and we try to use it for the glory of God and for his benefit, there's a world of sin and debauchery on that internet, too. And we need to guard ourselves against it. He says, Flee sexual immorality. Flee sexual immorality. Why? Because it gets a hold on us. And, and it's not the only sin that's like that. There's other sins that can get a hold on us, but sexual immorality is one of those, any different kind, that can get a hold on our lives, that can consume us, and can render us ineffective for the kingdom of God. If you're truly saved, it doesn't make you lost, but it can make us ineffective. It can, it can mess with our holiness and how God designed us to walk. And he says that we're supposed to flee the sexual morality. He says, he says, do you not know, this is verse 19, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? The Bible says that when we receive Jesus Christ as Savior, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit dwells in us. That means that when we live this life, when we walk through this world, we're not just representing ourselves, we're representing Jesus because the Spirit of God lives in us. We're a temple of the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, he says, you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. You know, this is one of the objections that I hear people say to responding to salvation or receiving Jesus Christ as their Savior. Say, boy, boy, boy it says right there that you're, you're not your own. You're bought with a price. You just want to be enslaved to Jesus. Yep. But let me tell you something. You're enslaved to something. You're either enslaved to sin and your own fleshly desires and, and, and a path that leads to destruction. Or we can be enslaved to Jesus the one who designed us, the one who knows us, the one who knew before anybody even knew who you were, before you were in your mother's womb, God knew you. He knew your likes and your dislikes. He knew the foods that you would put in your mouth that would bring great joy to you because he designed you to enjoy those things that are his creation. And your God who designed you desires a relationship with you and desires the very best for you. And what God knows is that when we live for our fleshly desires, it's not the best. Oh, sin's good for a fleeting moment. It's exciting, and it can even be pleasurable for a moment. But it leads to destruction. And even for the Christian who, who wouldn't lose their salvation, but it leads to a life that is separated from what God designed how we're supposed to live. And when we walk in holiness, it's not that life's perfect, but life's not perfect no matter what. In this world, you will have troubles. 
That's a promise from God's word. We don't see that one on the back of cars very often. The truth is we're going to face trials. We're going to face difficulties in this world no matter what. The question is do we want to walk with the one who created this world, who carries us through the trials and has given us the promise that when we take our final breath on this world, we'll be in heaven with him. That's how I want to walk, and that's how I want to live with Jesus. Are you walking in holiness? Are you living to please God or please self? Have you trusted in Jesus Christ for salvation? And if not, today is the day of salvation. That's what the Bible says. Today is the day of salvation. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what your past is. It doesn't matter. It, I, I've talked. I remember. I remember going door to door one time, and I and I talked to this guy, and I invited him to come to church, and he said, he said, Nah, man. He said, If I came to your church, he says the walls would fall down. And I said, No, they won't, because they didn't fall down when I walked in. And I'm a sinner just like anybody else. But praise God, Jesus Christ saved me from my sins. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've been. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And it says that whoever calls, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Do you need to call on him today? Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I do thank you. I thank you, Lord, for your word. And I thank you, Lord, for salvation that we find through your word. Lord, I thank you that you loved us enough to send Jesus Christ to die on that cross to pay the price for our sins. And Lord, I thank you that you loved us enough to inspire men of old to write it down so that we can gather and study your word, hear your truth, and understand your great love for us and your desire for our salvation. Lord, I pray right now if there's anyone in this room who's never trusted in you for salvation, that today would be the day Today would be the day that they confess you as Lord, that they turn from their sins, and they surrender to your Lordship in their life. Lord, I pray right now in these next few moments that you would have your way, that you would speak to our hearts, or that your Holy Spirit would move. Have your way in this place right now. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Will you stand? We're going to sing one song of response right now. And I'm going to ask you to take some time. Maybe you don't need to sing. Maybe you need to prepare your heart because we're going to take the Lord's Supper here in a little bit. If you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, now's the time. Come down. I'll be right here as we sing this song. I'd love to talk, to talk more with you about what it means to place your faith and trust in Jesus. But you respond. Christian, you respond now to the Holy Spirit as we worship Him and prepare for the Lord's Supper. the 
around His body lay Light of the world by darkness lay And bursting forth in glorious day Up from the grave he rose again And as he stands in victory I just thank you that we stand in the power of Christ today. Lord, we don't stand on our own power. We don't stand on our own authority. But Lord, we stand on the power of Christ, the one who defeated death, that we might receive life, life now and forever in eternity, life to the fullest. Lord, I thank you that as we approach this Lord's Supper table today, Lord, I thank you that we have the opportunity to remember the price that you paid. Lord, I pray that you would prepare our hearts. Lord, if there be unrepentant sin within us, Lord, right now I pray that we would repent, that we would turn it over. Lord, I confess that I am imperfect. Lord, I thank you that you forgave me on that day that you justified me. And I thank you that you forgive me still today when I make those mistakes. Lord, I pray that you would help me to walk in righteousness. Lord, have your way in this place now. Let your Holy Spirit move. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. You may be seated. We come to the Lord's Supper table today to remember Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. At Calvary, we practice what we call an open communion. And what that simply means is that you, if you have trusted Jesus Christ for salvation, if you are saved and therefore a child of God, you are welcome to take the Lord's Supper with us, whether you're a member or not. And it's up to each individual's conscience as they take the Lord's Supper, both in regards to uh, whether you're a believer or not, as well as whether we're in right standing with God or not. Because God's Word tells us that we should evaluate ourselves. The Bible says that it's part of the Christian walk to regularly check ourselves to see that we're in the faith. And so as we take the Lord's Supper today, let's remember that we do this in remembrance of what Jesus Christ did for us on that cross. That at that last supper, the Passover supper he had with his disciples before he was taken away, After the supper, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this bread represents my body that is broken for you. Amen.
Christ's body broken for us. In the same way, Jesus took a common cup. He said, the wine represents my blood that is spilled for you. God's word says that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. Jesus Christ shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus' blood poured out for us. Let's pray together. Dear my Father, Lord, I do thank you. I thank you for Jesus. Lord, I thank you for the salvation that he bought with his body and his blood. Lord, I thank you for your church that you've established through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And for the church that is represented here, your church that is represented here at Calvary. Lord, I pray that you would help us to walk in holiness, that you would help us to live in righteousness, and that you would help us to be the hands and feet of Jesus to make the good news of the gospel known, that we would make you known right here and around the world. Give us wisdom, give us guidance. Grow your kingdom. 
And will you give you the glory and the honor for all that you're going to do? It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.